Welcome back to Reinvent Healthcare. I'm Dr. Rita Marie Boscalzo, and I am passionately committed to helping people all around the globe to have the best health and the best life possible. And my mission and my passion stems from wanting to get health practitioners on board with true healthcare, with really getting to the root cause. And that's why you're here. So if you're struggling with or have patients that are struggling with depression or anxiety and you want practical strategies to help overcome these, today's episode is for you. I am thrilled to have a very special guest. But before we get started, I just want to remind you about the free brain health download guide that we have that you can download at reinventhealthcare.com forward slash brain. So I am so thrilled to have here as our guest, Dr. Ben Lynch. He's the best-selling author of Dirty Genes, and he's the president of Seeking Health. He's a company that educates people. He's passionate about educating people uh, to, to get to the root cause like we're doing, but really to understand genetics and how that plays into people's diet and lifestyle choices and the concept of nutrigenomics. And I first started uh, studying with Dr. Ben, oh, probably, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago when he had his first online, or not online, in-person course on genetics, and he just blew me away. And I love the research that he's been doing, and I love where he's going with this. And I also want to just say, I love his attitude that you can't just slap an, a supplement onto a genetic imbalance, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, Dr. Ben, welcome. Awesome to be here. Good to see you again. I'm super excited to have you here and to talk about serotonin. <laughs> so, you know, we've been, um, we're in a world, right, where so many people are depressed and so many people are on antidepressants. I was looking up stats and I saw anywhere from like 10 to 15 percent of the population is actually on antidepressant medications. So we need to do something about this, I believe. And many of them are SSRIs, which is what we're going to be talking about today, which is serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So we're going to talk about all things serotonin today and the genetics that play into that. And again, also hopefully what we can do about that as practitioners. So tell me a little bit more. Why do you think, first of all, do you think, genet do you think depression is actually a genetic disease? Or is it something else? Well, it, um, first of all, we have to define what depression is, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's degrees of, of depression. There's, and there are all sorts of different types of depression. And drug companies love to label different things so they can prescribe certain uh, drugs for, for those things. But at the end of the day, depression is lack of motivation and lack of feeling happy and, and lack of you know, just general good spirits. And so, you know, genetics do play a role for sure in depression. However, the genetic, uh, to say that you're depressed because of your genetics, no, um, I, 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 no, I don't think so. Um, and I don't want to say I know so because there's always things that it was like, whoa, I didn't know that. Um, but when I read a research paper years ago that looked at the genetic susceptibility to depression, there was this huge, I forget what they call it, but you have a center and then outside of that center, there's association mm. with one gene. So there's a gene in the center, there's associations with depression that are closely related to that central gene that's highly related to depression. And you blew it out, they're still related. And you blew it again and again and again. And there's a specific term for those diagrams, but I don't remember what it is. But I want to ask you, what gene do you think was central to depression? Um, that's a good question. MTHFR? Yeah. Nope. That was closely related. That was really close to the center, but it wasn't center. Okay. One more so, guess. Okay, one more guess. guess. Com T? Nope. That's real again, really close. Uh, TNF alpha. Oh. Inflammation was the Inflammation. most central aspect of out of all the genes in a human genome, 
according to this research paper that looked at which genes are associated with depression, TNF, TNF alpha was number one. MAO-A, COMT, MTGFR, they were all right there um, along with other ones. And I was just like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. It does. It does. And well, inflammation is an epidemic right now, right? And inflammation is at the heart of just about every disease we can think of. Right. And why not depression, right? Yeah. But what it, it does, go ahead. And if you look at tryptophan metabolism, so tryptophan feeds into making 5-HTP, which then feeds into making serotonin. But that's one direction, as I most likely showed you years ago in, in my conferences, tryptophan can also go a different direction, and that's towards the, what's called the kynurenin pathway, which is the immune system. And so it makes sense that inflammation is at the heart of depression because tryptophan gets depleted significantly through inflammatory processes. And, you know, at the end of the day, when you're sick, you know, your body's primary function is to get over being sick. So it's going to focus on the immune system, which is what the tryptophan gets used for through the kynurenin pathway. It doesn't care if you're happy or not. That's not going to increase survival. Right. Um, right. So serotonin is kind of a lower priority. Interesting. That is fascinating. And I'm really kind of glad to hear that because what it does is it gives us more tools because we know we know how to manage um, inflammation, I think, much better than we know how to manage depression because pharmaceuticals don't necessarily work. I've seen many a patient, and I'm sure you have, who has been on SSRIs, Prozac or Zant, whatever, but bunches of them now. Prozac was probably the first one. And they've been on them, and they just keep increasing their doses. And then they get to a point where it's like, well, that's not working too well anymore. Let's add another one in and another one in. And then we step in and we help them with managing their diet. I remember one person who I just took, said, okay, we're going to go through this slowly, but start with going off gluten and come back, you know, and, and let's talk. She comes back in a month after going off gluten and tells me that not only is her depression better, they wanted her to go on extra medication. She cut her medication in half, right? Yeah. Just by going off gluten. And we know gluten and egg creates inflammation. So there's just so much here. So, so we've got this, and you mentioned um, serotonin, right? Serotonin and how it's created. But let's talk about reuptake because there's things that affect the synthesis of serotonin. There's things that affect the reuptake of ser serotonin. So just give our listeners a little bit of a refresher on the whole uptake me take mechanism and how we can identify people who are at a risk of depression based on their genes. TNF-alpha surely is a biggie. And if you have TNF-alpha, you get much bit more prone to not just depression, but a whole lot of other inflammatory diseases, right? Yeah. So when you reuptake serotonin, you're, you're pulling it out of uh, the area where it's active. You're pulling it out of the synapse. And so if you're, if you're taking an SSRI, then you are, by, by design, ideally trying to keep serotonin within the synapse for it, the serotonin to make a signal and, and bind to a receptor. The problem with, with that is that you are assuming that there's any serotonin being produced uh, in that individual's brain to begin with. Um, now, of course, there probably is some serotonin being synthesized, but A, how much? And then B is how are there transport proteins? Are they actually being able to, do, to deliver the serotonin to the synapse. And then the other one is how fast is their serotonin being broken down? So MAO-A is a primary gene which breaks down uh, serotonin. And so if you just take an SSRI and you are not addressing the synthesis and the transport and the uh, slowing the breakdown of serotonin, then you're, you're not helping the patient very much, which is most likely why SSRIs aren't helping in the first place because these other systems are, are problematic and the information hasn't been addressed. Um, so I, I don't know all the epigenetics of ser uh, serotonin reuptake and, um, you know, and how that works. 
I'm looking now at my pathway, which I uh, designed some time ago. And serotonin, um, the higher your serotonin levels are, the faster you reuptake it, which also makes sense. So it's, it's yeah. think of it like diabetes where, you know, you have a lot of blood sugar going on in your in your body. You want your blood sugar to be pulled out of your system. Actually, it's not like diabetes at all. It's the opposite. But the more serotonin you have, the the more the body's going to say, you got too much, I'm going to pull some out because having too much isn't good. Okay. So my mm-hmm. diabetes uh, summary wasn't, wasn't helpful at all. Um, oh, and I have other things here. Um, inflammation uh, increases, uh, high inflammation decreases reuptake, low oxygen um, speeds the uptake. No, wait a minute. This is really confusing. So a high altitude. So the higher you are in elevation, okay. the slower the uptake of serotonin you are. Which also makes sense because you can get serot- you can get elevation sickness, right? So you get elevation sickness, and what is that? And, and I don't know all the drugs that they use, but it'd be interesting to see that. Uh, but high elevation um, slows uh, the reuptake, and inflammation uh, also slows uh, the reuptake to try to you know keep some serotonin in your brain because probably more tryptophan is being depleted. Um, and then you got the serotonin receptors too, and not enough people talk about the receptors of serotonin. If your receptors are not working, you can have, let's say that the production of serotonin is amazing, the reuptake is not very fast, and the breakdown is also slow. It's all it's all perfect. You got you, lots of serotonin in the synapse, but now it has to bind to a receptor in order for it to function. If there is no binding of serotonin to a receptor, there is no effect. And what binds to receptors that is a huge problem that slows things down pesticides i was just gonna say toxins right pesticides Tox- yep <clears throat> yep yeah so that's a it's a big one and there's there's an herb um which is very supportive it's a natural ssri and uh that's saffron saffron really saffron is a natural ssri and it's got lots of research behind it and you only need about is it uh, a pinch? Yeah, you only need thirty milligrams of a saffron extract to wow uh, by design get an effect. Whoa, who would have known? It's it's one yeah. of the most expensive spices out there, though, right? It's not as common places like it is, you know ginger. It's an expensive ingredient, uh, nutri- you know, as a nutraceutical to use, um, but uh, it's it's quite effective. And what if you do saffron and you put it on rice or other foods? Does that have the effect or does it have to be more concentrated? That's a great question. Um, the extract that we use, um, it's called saffron side. And I don't know, it's it's a, I don't remember if it's a, it says saffron extract. So I don't know if it's a whole plant extract or it's, I don't or think anything. it's a, it's, you know, I don't think it's a single component of saffron. I think it's a whole plant extract. But if you look at saffron side, um, you can right. read the research papers on that. Great. I'd love to do that. So let's get back to, because our whole topic here was today was more about, like, what are the genetic factors? And, of course, we want to address how do you, you know, mitigate the impact yeah. or the potential impact but of the, the serotonin synthesis and the reuptake and, and the receptors. And I just want to add in, I talk about receptors all the time when it comes to hormones, and it's one of my pet peeves that people aren't talking about thyroid hormone resistance or progesterone resistance and all the other hormone resistances. And it never occurred to me to think about neurotransmitter resists the receptor resistance. So mm-hmm. that's really a good distinction. Yeah, that's it's really important. Anytime you take a supplement like a neurotropic, like a brain enhancing yeah. substance um, to support serotonin or acetylcholine or dopamine, it's best to what I call pulse it. You can't be taking these things every single day because you could be down-regulating the receptors. So you use them for, you know, on the days where you really need it. So if you are, you know, having depression or your patients are having depression, by all means, they should take a serotonin supportive supplement or their medications or change their diet or whatever they need to do. Um, but they, on the days where they're happy and in good spirits, they shouldn't touch that stuff. And that's the problem with medications is... They just are on them all the time, 
And so now you're just getting, you know, a blunted response. So now you, you think, okay, now I need to give them more. Well, now you're going to blunt the receptors even more. More. And you're thinking, as a, as a practitioner, you're thinking, oh my God, that explains so much. That explains my patient, you know, Sandy, who has been keeping increasing their dosage. Um, and that's a new effect. And there are a number of genes, you know, that my team has researched that slow the synthesis of of uh, serotonin. So my wife, um, she lets me use her strategy report often. <laughs> um, she has the the TPH two enzyme, which is slower, and so she, this is the TPH G seven O three T variant, and has reduced serotonin serotonin, uh, serotonin transmission and activation. Mm-hmm. So then you have, and this is a gene that's extremely important. That is, it's the it's the uh, uh, rate determining step of serotonin. So at this step, you really should have it working. And if it doesn't, that's where then 5-HTP can come into play. And 5-HTP bypasses this slowdown. And that's why some um, people do really well with 5-HTP. A lot of people do, yeah. 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 Okay. So that's interesting to know. So if the person has that, that genetic variant, right, and yep. it's slower then the 5-HTP, you know, it's, it's like anything. If there's a slowdown, if you give a lot more of that substrate, then it moves the pathway down. It doesn't fix the genetic, you know, imbalance with that enzyme. Yeah. For CPH2, the, uh, the substrate is tryptophan. The end product is a 5-HTP. So you could bypass it with 5-HTP, um, and that, which is handy because we have that readily available. But if it's genetically slower so in, like in my wife she does very well with serotonin um support she does really well with it on her days where she's blue yeah it really pulls her out um vitamin d supports also the activity of the tph uh enzyme okay. so low vitamin d when you have seasonal affective disorder in your patients then you're like oh yeah it's 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 fall it's winter their vitamin d levels are getting lower that's when a lot of my patients tend to get depressed. Well, it mm-hmm. makes sense if you look at it uh, epigenetically. Uh, you know, you you do see that vitamin D does support the synthesis of 5-HTP through that TPH enzyme. So it's in that step between tryptophan and 5-HTP that d- the Correct. D is a cofactor. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, that's good to know. You know, and it also explains what that that genetic variant. Some people do really well on tryptophan. Yeah. Some people don't do anything on tryptophan, and you have to give them 5-HTP. So looking at the genetic report can give you an idea of if you are going to supplement this person, do you need to go 5-HTP, which I believe is a little bit more pricey or harder to get. Well, it's pricey. You know, it's not really harder to get. And then straight tryptophan. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know. A tryptophan is, is – I used to offer tryptophan years ago, and I stopped – Uh, because it didn't sell. A lot of people still have fear over tryptophan because of the Japanese rice issue years and years and years ago. Um, 5-HTP doesn't have that issue. Um, But tryptophan was more supportive of also immune system, which people didn't understand. So I just stopped selling. It didn't work anyway. Um, And what's also important is is you can't just stop and say, okay, well, this individual's TPH2 enzyme is is slower, so I'm going to give them a bunch of 5-HTP. Well, initially, they may do very well, but then there's a next, there's another gene you should be aware of, and that's MAO-A. Mm-hmm. Is your patient's MAO-A enzyme tend to be slower or does it tend to be faster? And if it tends to be slower and you've given them 50 milligrams of 5-HTP and your patient's doing really well at 50 milligrams, and then they're like, oh, I feel good at you know one capsule of 50, I'm going to take two. And now they're irritable and cranky and they can't fall asleep and they're mad at people and they have headaches and you don't know what's going on, and they come to your clinic. He's like, "I'm taking the 5-HTP, and I feel worse now, Doc. I felt great now. I feel worse." If you understand their genetics, and you look at, and he's like, "Oh, you have a slow Mao A, or you're deficient in riboflavin," um, mm. that will increase your uh, your ability to break down serotonin. And so, by understanding your patient's genetics and their epigenetics, then you can explain. It's like, well. Did you take the one capsule like I, you know, instructed you? Uh, well, you know, yeah. It's like, did you take more than that? Yeah. Well, 
probably shouldn't do that because you have a slow MAUE and your ability to reduce serotonin out of your brain is, is a lot slower. And if you show them that, their compliance goes way up. If they understand, it's like genetically, my ability to produce serotonin is less, but my ability to get rid of it is also less, that I need to find, be very careful when I am taking 5-HTP. And then the opposite is also true. If I'm taking 5-HTP and I feel good for maybe an hour or two, and then I'm depressed again, but I have a fast mal A, and I am taking riboflavin as well, now... I'm getting depressed faster. If I take another 5-HTP, it boosts me out. So mm -hmm. one patient might do really well at 50 milligrams of 5-HTP, and you might have another patient who needs literally take one capsule of 5-HTP four times a day and avoid riboflavin. Wow. So there's so much, this is just really reinforcing the importance of looking at the whole picture. You can't just look yeah. at the genes. You have to look at the symptomatology. You have to look at sometimes lab testing that we can't just like, oh, let's do a genetic report and give you a supplement program protocol. Yeah, and then being done and I'll see you in six weeks. And I'll, you know, yeah, take exactly. this and I'll see you in six weeks. Instead, you could say, um, uh, you can say that, uh, look, this, this 5-HTP supplement, what it does is it supports your serotonin. This is what you should be feeling. You should be feeling a uh, better mood. You should be sleeping uh, more throughout the night because you need serotonin to convert to melatonin. Mm -hmm. And that's what it does. And so if you're falling asleep at night, but your patient isn't staying asleep, you could also give them 5-HT before bed. Mm -hmm. And then let's, let's say um, they fall asleep and they stay asleep for an hour or two, but uh, they um, wake up at one in the morning. Well, what do you do there? There's extended release 5-HTP that you can give them, which is actually 200 milligrams, which kind of is a slow trickle okay. uh, throughout their body at night, and it really makes a big difference. Um, but informing your patient what the supplement does and what their genes do and what the epigenetic factors that are involved, it really empowers them to make a decision. Do I need to take this today? This is how I feel, according to what my doctor shared with me? Yes. Do I, and the next day it comes along, do I need to take this today? Well, actually, no, I feel good today. I don't need to take it. Yeah. And that, that really uh, reduces a lot of headaches and phone calls um, that are immersion to your clinic. Yeah, absolutely. I love that because that's what I found. I've been doing this kind of work for over 30 years. And what I find is when I explain things to people and they understand when you eat this, this is what it does to your inflammation. When you do this or take that, this is what it does to your, your brain chemistry. They go, oh, I get it. It's not just here, here's your prescription, whether it's pharmaceutical or supplement. It's still like, here's your prescription, go do it. When they understand, they really do it. And the other thing I find, which is why I'm so fascinated and love working with genetics, is that when people see that they have a genetic tendency to a certain condition, mood, et cetera, they are so much more likely to do what you were going to tell them to do anyway, even if you didn't look at their genes, they go, right. oh, I guess I better do that or I'm going to end yeah. up with Parkinson's like my mother or whatever. So I find empowering people, that's, that's a biggie and that's what we teach in our practitioner trainings is we want to empower people to decide what they need when to the extent right. like like you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's amazing the the rate of compliance when you when you present them their genetics. The problem with most genetic reports that are out there is it's like if you have this, if you have this genetic variant, you take this supplement. And I, I find that as a major disservice um, because they, they lack the epigenetic controls of, of vitamin D, which you could say is a supplement, but it's also get your butt out in the sunlight um, and, uh, you know, eat more, uh, you know, cold water fish or, or what have you. And then there's smoking and caffeine and stressors and then and pesticides like we talked about. So let's say they're 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 taking the 5-HTP and they're like, Doc, it doesn't work. And it's like, well, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, I, I, we had a big bunch of ants and so I sprayed pesticides all over the place. And obviously they're not going to say that, but you need to do your, he did your your sleuthing thing. And, and ask what's going on in terms of pesticide use and instruct them and say, look, pesticides block your ability to bind serotonin to your brain. <laughs> so you should probably uh, not do that. 
Yeah, I love that. That's a great way to say it too. It just yeah. blocks her ability to bind serotonin. We already talked about that serotonin, you know, lack of serotonin might be causing your, de- or is causing your depression if you've already determined that. So this yeah. is cool. And then you mentioned, you know, so we talked about the synthesis. We talked about the, okay, tell me the name of that one again. Yeah, TPH2. It's the- TPH2. Uh, yeah, that's the, what's it called? It's the tryptophan hydroxylase. Okay, tryptophan, I'll, I'll remember that. So the TBH2, and then um, we talked about MAO-A and how that comes into play there faster or slower, and that's going to affect our supplementation doses, our recommendations for 5-HTP, or is that TPN, uh, <laughs> the, the hydroxylase, the tryptophan hydroxylase is going to affect whether we're going to recommend tryptophan versus 5-HTP. Or, mm-hmm. uh, and then right. we talked about the uptake, right, or, or the, yeah, the receptors, and we talked right. about pesticides blocking that are there other things that block it and are there other things that can help improve the function of those yeah so there's there's uh there there are um serotonin the more serotonin you have in the brain uh the more likelihood is to bind to a receptor so that's kind of obvious but again remember the more serotonin you have in your synapse the more likely it is that you're going to reabsorb it so and pull it out of your brain so there's a there's a sweet spot there Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's interesting, uh, caffeine and smoking sensitize your receptors to serotonin. Really? So if your patients are smokers and they are uh, drinking caffeine, those two substances mm-hmm. uh, support the sensitivity of serotonin binding to, binding to their brain, which then reinforces them wanting to drink more caffeine and smoke more right. cigarettes. Right. So if you show them that, you say, look, you know, if we support you with 5-HTP, we eliminate your pesticide use, uh, you know, we can probably wean down your smoking habits and your your uh, caffeine addiction. Uh, but you have to do it slowly because if you do it too quickly, they're going to get depressed. Right. So How long? What do you consider slowly? Um, I think every patient is going to be different. You know, so, uh, caffeine... Uh, there are genes involved with caffeine. There's cytochrome B450s that some people are fast metabolizers and some are slower. Um, and then there's also adenosine receptors. So caffeine blocks the adenosine receptors in your brain. That's how it works. Um, mm-hmm. Caffeine doesn't actually give you energy um, by caffeine itself. Caffeine actually blocks the compound, which actually makes you sleepy. So that's mm-hmm. how that works. Um, and so everyone's different. Um, so I, I don't have a time frame there. And there's a, there's another gene which we should talk about, and that's the serotonin transporter. So again, you need to transport serotonin. It's actually carried, mm-hmm. and um, so this gene is a uh, solute carrier family 18, uh, also known as uh, VMAT1, which I don't know what it stands for. Um, but uh, there's a variant when homozygous, and it's common, that increases the transport of serotonin by 370 percent. Whoa. Yeah. So massive, massive. So, and it's interesting, you know, the more genetic reports that you look at, the more you start seeing patterns. And I don't really want to say compensations, but it's, it's, it's kind of a compensation. So the gen, I will say something short about genetic variations. Most genetic variations that are affecting serotonin that we're talking about have been selected for and passed down and we've inherited. So there are there are biological advantages to having these mm-hmm. for some reason. And um, so it all depends on a myriad of reasons, but there's some biological advantage because they're in us today, right? We would have been mm-hmm. dead had there been not any biological mm-hmm. advantage. Um, so they've been passed along with us. But I see, so remember my wife has a reduced ability to uh, synthesized serotonin through the TPH2 enzyme. Mm-hmm. She has a, uh, let me remind myself, she has a uh, intermediate uh, speed to eliminate serotonin. She has reduced serotonin sensitivity on a receptor, but she has a heightened ability to transport serotonin. Mm-hmm. So there's things that are like that goes back to what I was saying. There's like compensatory like genetic variations, yeah. You know that kind of balance and, and offset because if my wife was slow to produce, fast to eliminate, 
slow to bind the receptor and slow to transport, well, then she'd probably be extremely depressed. And uh, you might actually find that in, in some individuals, and they're probably really struggling, especially if they're inflamed. Wow. So much to it. Um, so yeah. we talked about those genes. Are there specific genes that are affected or that affect reuptake? That's where all the the, the drugs are targeting them. Yeah, there there are. So there's the, the SLC6A4 is the gene that uh, works on serotonin reuptake. Um, we do not report, and in, in, in my uh, genetic report strategy, we do not report that. And I don't remember why offhand. It's either because um, uh, it was a pharmacogenetic variation and pharmacogenetics, uh, pharmacokinetic uh, drugs, uh, or pharmacokinetic, geez, pharmacokinetic genetic variations are highly regulated by the FDA. Mm. So if I report a genetic variation that it is a drug targeting gene, that I could get flagged and, and say you're reporting something that's significant, which makes sense. So I'm sure there's research on the SLC6A4 and you could look it up. Um, and, um, but I don't, I don't have that, um, okay. uh, information. That affects the, so in your opinion, I don't know if you've done any research on this, but how did we come from a, you know, pharmaceutical standpoint? to focus on reuptake when there's so much more to serotonin metabolism? Uh, I think it's very simple. I think the, the drug companies, either by accident, which if a lot of drugs are used and they find a, uh, a benefit, I mean, these drugs to, uh, you know, BP bisphenol A was actually uh, supposed to be a drug to do something with estrogen in women from what I remember. And mm. um, they ended up not using it and now it's just everywhere. Um, so... I, I think that drug companies got a result through SSRIs and they're like, oh, well, let's just block the reuptake and we're good. And we're good. Um, stop there. You know, and we'll just stop there. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, why invest more dollars if they're getting a result? And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that they don't look at the nutrition because when you look at the nutrition and vitamin D, it's uh, significant importance of the tryptophan hydroxylase gene. Um, and then you have, um, you know, things like daylight and vitamin B6, which is uh, heavily uh, becomes a problem in women on birth control. You know, mm -hmm. B6 deficiency in birth control is a problem. And so if you have a woman who's on birth control and she's depressed and uh, she has this genetic variation and she has low vitamin D levels, yeah, you could give her, you could give her 5-HTP, but if she's deficient in B6, She's not going to convert that 5-HTP to serotonin. Remember, 5-HTP doesn't equal serotonin. 5-HTP is a substrate to make serotonin, and you need the dopamine decarboxylase gene to, to convert 5-HTP to serotonin, and that requires vitamin B6. Doesn't it also require C and copper, if I'm thinking of it correctly? Uh, it could, yeah. yeah. It could. But I, and on my diagram, I don't have that. So, yeah, but I, it does sound vaguely familiar. Yeah. So it's food, it's food and supplementation versus a drug. And of course, food and supplementation uh, are not patentable. But so, if, yeah. you yeah. know, like a drug which might cost $150 a month to take, these things are, you know, pennies to the dollar to take. And yeah. they're actually fixing a problem versus, you know, supporting just something that creates more of a problem. I think creates more of a problem and creates that that dependency, right? Well, it is a total dependency because what happens if your patient stops taking an SSRI? You know, right. they're mm -hmm. going to get depressed again. There's mm -hmm. no there's no long term benefit to that because all it's doing is it's forcing the prevention of the reuptake. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's not right. supporting the synthesis. The synthesis. Or the binding or anything. And mm -hmm. and then you could say, well, saffron isn't either. Well, you're right. By just taking saffron, you're not supporting the patient's long-term gains either. So, you know, you there's some that they call them green allopaths in school, which I, I never yes. liked that term. Um, but by 
they're essentially right. You know, if if you're not a fan of an SSRI, you don't just switch to using saffron because you're still not treating the underlying cause of the patient. You have to look at the whole picture. Um, and so when I formulate supplements, I look at the synthesis, the transport, the the binding, the reuptake, and the uh, breakdown. I look at all five of those. And I look at all the enzymes that are related to it. And I look at all the epigenetic factors. And I look at all the nutrients and cofactors associated with it. And I think, okay, how can I put all these things into one formula and make it work? And so that's what I do when I make um, you know, our serotonin nutrients, our dopamine nutrients, and our, our optimal focus, which is for acetylcholine. So I, I look at all those things. The acetylcholine is a separate subject, but acetylcholine is rapidly degraded in the, in the brain through inflammation as well. Mm-hmm. So if you just give a patient choline to support their acetylcholine, they might get a benefit for literally only half an hour to an hour, and then they're already out of, out of touch. Again. Their memory sucks. Their focus sucks. Right. Um, yeah, because the breakdown's too fast. Well, so there's so much, you know, as practitioners, um, yeah, I love that. Well, I, I know you don't like that term, but I, I use that term when I'm saying, look, I went to this functional medicine, or I went to this naturopath, and they just did a bunch of tests and hand me a bunch of supplements. And, and looking for this, for that, we get a lot of people who come to us and say, you know, so what herbs do I have, give people for? hot flashes. What right. herbs do I give yeah. people for anxiety? And I'm like, it doesn't work that way. It's not mm-hmm. a this for that. It's not allopathic. We have to create, figure out what the imbalances are, figure out what's causing the imbalances. If there's no genetic um, variant in there that's underlying, then most of it's going to come from from the lifestyle. And right, we don't have to, oh, just give them, here's some this and here's, oh, let's just go on Dr. Ben's um, serotonin nutrients instead of taking your SSRI. It, it doesn't work like that. But the other question I have about you, if you're formulating these into one one package, right? And how do we handle it when, you know, some people have different uh, areas that we're addressing? We may be addressing all of that, but they're different with the dosing, right? Because there's there's yeah. the set dosing, obviously, if you're creating a, a, a capsule. Yeah, for sure. Um, so huh, I tend to formulate uh, uh, pretty high potency things. And I've learned that um, it backfires. So I'm, I'm, I've been pulling back and I've been, mm-hmm. I've been working on, Ben, you don't need to you know, send in the, the full army, <laughs> just, right. just reduce, reduce, reduce the potency. The thing is when you read the research on various nutri- nutraceuticals, um, like saffron, uh, being effective at a dose at 30 milligrams, you want to say, okay, I'm utilizing the research dose at 30 milligrams in my supplement. You say, okay, I've done that. And then the research dose of say five HTP is 15 milligrams. Okay, I've done that too. The research dose of B6 is X. They use that. And then there's there's other ones um, as well. So you want to use the researched amounts, but then there's a synergy that happens. And so if you utilize all the nutrients at the same time, um, then the effect is very significant and very powerful. So while I'm only using 50 milligrams of 5-HTP and I'm only using 30 and just, you know, maybe five or 10 of B6. And then I also have curcumin in there for the, for the inflammatory Patient. part. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it still packs a, a, a significant punch and you literally feel it within 10 minutes of taking it. It's, wow. It boggles my mind how fast it works. And the first thing you notice is um, brightness. Everything, the colors are brighter, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you talk to people who struggle with migraines, the first thing they see it's like, oh my God, everything is brighter. Mm-hmm. And that's because with, with migraines, initially there's low serotonin, which triggers a migraine. And then when the migraine is happening, uh, it's actually high serotonin. The body compensates. So low serotonin triggers a migraine. High serotonin is involved in the migraine. Um, so uh, basically to answer your question, 
Um, you have to inform your patient, this is what the supplement's doing, and this is what you're going to notice. You're going to notice increased uh, brightness and increased uh, uh, happier moods, and that's where you want to be. If you're starting to experience nausea or headache, it's too much. Mm -hmm. But you, it's also difficult because you can they can be having a headache from low serotonin too as well. Okay. So it's it's just it's a little bit tough, and it's the the patient really at the end of the day has to learn where their sweet spot is, and they also need to learn that on the days that they're happy, they don't touch it, they yeah. just leave it alone, and it, you can. You can get in a really stressful situation. Maybe you got pulled over by a policeman, or you know, your cat died, or you got yelled at by your partner. Something happened, and now you just instantly just got depressed because uh, acute stress can wipe out your serotonin too. And so at that moment, you could take a serotonin nutrient, and you could it could lift you out. Interesting. Um, so it's it's more again going back to informing and teaching your patient. Right, teaching them to be empowered. Last question on that. Because I'm a big fan of the minimum effective dose, right? What is the minimum effective dose? But when we're dealing with a 90-pound woman or a 250-pound weightlifter, they're going to have very different minimal effective doses. So, you know, how do you handle that? And I, you know, I don't formulate. I like to get individual nutrients like this powder and this powder and this right. powder and just have them play with it until they find the right dose, which could take a lot longer, right? If, if they take your serotonin nutrients and they get immediate results they're not going to be patient with that other yeah it's it's um so you, you take the serotonin nutrients and you can open the capsule and you can you just use a little bit just little that's pinch. one route um and uh the other one uh what was i going to say um even if you're a, a you know like a, a 90 pound woman you could still have significant nutrient deficiencies mm -hmm. and you could have significant inflammation which then, and you could have significant underlying genetic variations. So they might need the entire whole capsule. Mm -hmm. um, and you could have a, you know, I'm 220 pounds and I do very well. I think this is a, this is a one capsule serving. So yeah. I do well on one capsule. If I, if I took two, it'd be a problem. And, and another one is uh, the optimal focus one. That's a three capsule serving. I'm 220 pounds. I take one capsule and I'm fine. I'm mm -hmm. good. I'm I'm locked in. If I take three, it's 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 too much for me. Um, yeah. But even though that's the suggested serving size, because once again, that's those are the researched amounts. So I, I yeah. hear what you're saying. I, I do like the individual nutrients as well. Um, but I've found with especially neurotransmitters that that synergy is extremely synergy, important. Right. You need to support this production the transport, the binding, and the reduction of the breakdown. And if you do that, the effect is, wow, it's it's fast and it's it's impressive and the compliance is, is really good. So if you have someone, like say I decide I want to try your supplement. I'm not depressed. I don't have lack of focus. I'm totally fine in that area. If I take it, will there be, will I notice some negative effects? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, uh, I want to create a, um, a tool, uh, at some point that's a spectrum. It's like a, it's like a, you know, like a protractor, you got that yeah. you know, shape like this and then there's degrees. And if you have mm -hmm. the perfect level of serotonin, it's right in the middle and you got great mood, you got great, um, uh, blood clotting because serotonin is involved with that, which is confusing as all get out. Um, and then you've got, um, you know, bowel movements and, and other things. Um, so, and good libido. If you take too much serotonin, you're going to get nauseated. Um, you're going to get pukey. You're going to have loose stools. Uh, your libido mm -hmm. is going to go to hell. Um, and you're probably going to get a headache. Um, so those are, those are, and it's good to know those things because, it, and you inform your patient, look, it's like, okay, look, if you take serotonin nutrients and you have a great mood, your head feels fine. Your eyes are bright. Your bowel movements are fantastic. Perfect. That's where we want you. In the event you're taking it, now you're you're experiencing loose stools. You're getting headaches. Uh, your libido is kind of, eh. You know, you're taking too much and back off. Maybe you don't need a whole capsule. Maybe you need mm -hmm. half. So try mm -hmm. half. 
Um, and they're gonna say, well, when do I need it? Well, you take it when you're depressed and you take it when you are, you fall asleep, but you wake up way too early in the evening. You know, like it, you say you fall asleep at 10 o'clock at night and you wake up at midnight or one o'clock, taking it before bed would be a, a good time. Good idea. Uh, constipated, probably should take it. Um, you know, if you're struggling from migraines, you probably should take it um, before, not during. During would be bad. Terry and then let's say, bad. okay, let's say they, they got confused and they took the serotonin nutrients um, when they had a headache, but it was a headache that was involved with high serotonin. Lithium blocks um, the binding of serotonin to, I think, the transport proteins or the receptors. So it's good to know an antidote. I call mm. it an antidote. So by giving lithium orotate, five milligrams to someone who's been giving serotonin nutrients, you can antidote some of these side effects. Wow. Kind of like um, niacin is to the methyl group. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Interesting. And, um, you know, let's, the opposite is also true. If you work with a patient who's having a panic attack um, and you give them lithium orotate and you pull them out and they get all happy in there, it's like, wow, that really helped me. And it helped me a lot. And when something really helps the patient, what do they do? They take it again. They take more. Mm -hmm. Lithium really helped me. They take lithium when they're fine. They took it when they had a panic attack. They felt great. Now the next day they feel great and they take lithium because it made them feel great. Well, they forgot that they had a panic attack. Now they're depressed. <laughs> so <laughs> then, then you say, no, you don't take lithium when you're fine. You take lithium when you're panicking and anxious and stressed out. And so now you take the, the serotonin nutrients to pull you out. So it's 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 fun to teach patients like that because they feel like, yeah, I got this. I'm empowered. Yeah. 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 I and mean, you don't have to think like I'm buying this bottle of supplements. So I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life and the cost and the inconvenience. And they go, I'm going to take it when I need it. And I know how to tell right. when I need it. Yeah. And it's yeah. very important that they take it when they need it because if they take it when they don't need it, then it's a it's a problem. And, and oftentimes doctors, we all get stuck. If a supplement has helped a patient, that's where we that's where we leave it. It's like methylfolate really helped you. Your homocysteine levels are good, your mood's good, your cognitive abilities are good. But, you know, I don't know what your headaches are associated with, you know, your irritability. I don't know what that's your tingling in your muscles, your nerve pain, your runny nose. I don't know what that's from. We just figure that out. Well, it's too much methylfolate. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that a a, a nutrient can be in excess. And yeah. so we're very quick to prescribe another supplement when it's already the existing supplement that's causing the problems or just taking it too much or taking it too much or too frequently or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to another point, talking about methylfolate. Can you get an excess of methylfolate by eating lots and lots of greens? Apparently Lucky. not. Yeah, Good. apparently not. There's, and I, and I don't know the mechanism behind that. I'm assuming it's the, the folate uh, transport proteins that are binding the folate coming out of the intestine and, and bringing it into the body. And then somehow they, there's a feedback mechanism that tells the body to stop bringing that folate in. We have enough. Um, just like in the, in the body, if you have sufficient serotonin levels, uh, there's a feedback mechanism that tells the dopamine de decarboxylase gene to stop making more serotonin. Mm. So there's, there's feedback inhibitors all over the place. So I'm assuming that that's going to be the same way be in, in terms it's of... It's dose-dependent too, right? Because you're not going to... Well, you get a lot in food, but it's like it's all concentrated into this one little capsule. Yeah, and eat. then how good is the digestion? How well are they chewing? How good right. is their, their veli and their intestine? Um, so yeah, there's multiple multiple factors there. Okay, cool. Well, this has been amazing. Is there anything you want to leave people with as a parting message um if you if there was moments where you felt overwhelmed in this uh <laughs> that's totally okay i've given myself many a headache studying this stuff so i'm happy i i passed that on to you <laughs> this is uh this is very tough stuff um and it's stuff that we should have learned in medical school but we didn't um stuff that we should have learned in whatever school that you went to right. um but we didn't and it's exciting to learn it. And I just encourage you just to start using it. 
And the more you start using it, yes, you're going to make mistakes, but a doctor, you make mistakes all the time. And at the end of the day, it's called a practice anyway. I mean, practice makes perfect, but at the end of the day, we're, we're ne we'll never be perfect. Still all body thing. Right? Still, <laughs> we're still practicing. Um, so uh, just dive in and give it a go and just start with one thing and you're going to just keep learning. So yeah, um, I love it. strategy is our genetic report. If you want to dive in full circles with that and, and uh, we have good videos and a whole course on how to learn it. Um, great. So great. Yeah. And you have um, the, well, the dirty genes book is more, you know, the lay population. Do you have any other? Yeah, this dirty genes book is, is, is simple. But it's also still very informative. So if you want to just get your toes wet and 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 learn about it that way, Dirty Jeans is a is a great um, uh, beginning. And I, I do recommend the Audible version, um, so you can just listen to it. But then you you want to get the paperback at some point. Um, in the in the appendix, we have a very thorough uh, uh, list of laboratory uh, analysis and tests uh, to use, and I explain what the markers mean um, for various different genes. And so you, you learn a lot through that. Awesome. And um, I know you were working on, I know you finished some sort of, um, was it a book or it was it the products that you were working on when I checked in with you last fall? Yeah. So serotonin nutrients um, is out now and it's, okay. it's helping uh, a number of people. Um, it's been well received generally. Some people are complaining of, of looser stools. Um, and, uh, that is something that you need to be mindful of because serotonin is primarily in the gut, right? So it right. does support gut motility. Um, but generally speaking, it's been, uh, it's been great. Um, and then we're working on a, a histamine report that, uh, is beyond the scope of this call. Um, but it's, we're going to be making, uh, reports that are way more comprehensive in terms of certain things but at the same time way easier to understand strategy and report is as it is today is still very difficult for a lot of people um, practitioners included um, so we're looking for ways to make it simpler and um, but still keeping it accurate that's a trick <laughs> so that the histamine report will be coming out for that great um, so Awesomeness. We'll have all the links to everything on the show notes page so you guys can refer. And, you know, it's really important to study this and to do the research. And Dot, thank you for doing a lot of that for us. But we still have to understand it. It's not like you can say, oh, well, Dr. Ben Lynch said I should do this, so therefore I'm going to do it. No, you want to understand each individual person that you're working with because it is it is different. I mean, we're epigenetically, genetically, and lifestyle, everything is we're all unique and we have slightly different uh, approaches. Yeah, and it's it's um, it's really empowers your patient and you in your clinic because when your patient walks in and they're they're taking SSRI or let's say they're taking the serotonin nutrients and the patient comes in is like, wow, doc, this is really helping me, fantastic. You know that that was Sally, and then Harry walks in. Harry walks in, doc, I'm taking serotonin nutrients and this is happening. I'm feeling like this. You can know exactly what's going on. And you can figure it out. Whereas before, you would just kind of panic and like choose a different supplement. And you're kind of guessing, but you don't let them know you're guessing. It's like, oh, yeah, you should try this one. Now you don't, it's not really try this one. It's like, okay, well, you ask a few questions and you you make some adjustments. And then they go home and they they shoot you a quick message and like, yeah, doc, that worked. Thanks. I'm, I'm good now. It, it, right. I realized I was just taking it on days I shouldn't have or. I reduced it to half a capsule or, or what have you, where I was taking 5-HTP with it. You know, some people do that. They're like, oh, yeah, I took my SSRI today and I took a serotonin nutrients. Like, whoa, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That's great advice because, um, you know, we have when I always say when something doesn't work, it gives us just as much information as when something yes, does work. That's right. Right. I was on this drug and it didn't work. This drug caused me to have this. Oh, this drug worked well. We can, if we understand the biochemistry, which is, I think, super critical for everybody to do, is to have all those practitioners need to understand the biochemistry. Then you can go, oh, well, that didn't work and that affects this pathway. This did work. Therefore, here's some of the interventions yeah, or things I, I can say. I'd be 
be very mindful with the language when you're talking with your patient about something like this and say, don't apologize. So let's say you prescribe them serotonin nutrients and they come back and they're like, Doc, I had the worst migraines, like whatever you gave me didn't work. You're like, well, you know, I'm, you know, it's a, it's a, I mean, that situation is like, well, I'm sorry that you had a headache, right? You don't say, I'm sorry I gave you serotonin nutrients. Right. I'm sorry right. you experienced a headache. You know, however, that is a, that's useful information to know. So let's, mm -hmm. here's, here's what happened. And you explain the mechanism behind it and they, they listen and they're like, okay, so that's too much serotonin. So how do we deal with this? And we work on it this way and you, you make some, some, some changes and say that's still very useful information. While it wasn't fun to go through, you that information is going is is a piece of the puzzle. So, and um, you yep. know, so it's it's uh, it's very handy to have uh, a multifaceted understanding of serotonin pathways and all the other pathways because when you know that, you can make the changes and you're confident in your new recommendation or your altered recommendation. I wouldn't say altered. Your tweaked and improved recommendation. Yeah, I like that word tweak. I like to tweak things. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Well, thank you so so much for being here, and uh, appreciate your knowledge, your your breath, your unrelenting interest in research uh, and figuring these things out because it makes it so much easier for the rest of us to just learn from you. And if you haven't already learned from Dr. Ben Lynch, I would head out to his website. Seekinghelp.com is the supplement website. And I think it's drbenlynch.com, which is your professional website. Is that right? Yes, professional website. There's some articles there. Um, this, I haven't updated it. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I'm pretty active on Instagram, but I'm not shadow banned. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you can find me there. And there's there's quite a number of practitioners follow me there. And and yeah. um, so uh, yeah. I, I respond to a lot of comments um, from people. So... And uh, I learn a lot from from DMs and and from talking with people on Instagram, and um, so great. it's yeah, it's great. That's great. So thanks again, and uh, for everybody listening, thank you for listening. You're part of the the new healthcare, the real healthcare. As we learn and as we grow and as we learn how these mechanisms work, and we learn novel approaches to old conditions. Right? We are the people that help. We're giving people hope. And just stay present with it. Yeah, sometimes it gets hard to do all the research, but a lot of us have done that research, some of that research for you and are providing great education. So there's no lack of good education. So you can visit Dr. Ben Lynch's site and look at some of those courses and the videos and all that. Uh, we have inemethod.com. You'll learn more about some of the stuff that we're doing in the Institute of Nutritional Endocrinology. And then download the, the brain hand out the brain resource guide that we created for this series of podcasts and is at reinventhealthcare.com forward slash brain and then keep learning and keep being passionate and apply this lifestyle diet nutrition nutritional supplements and then also the genetics and the lab testing and with all that you're equipped to help people as long as you understand what's going on in there right you understand the genetic the uh, biochemistry so thank you for being here, and until next time, shine on.